There we go. <clears throat> okay, let's go ahead and get started. Mike, you wanted to uh, to open? Sure. I want to thank everybody for showing up tonight for uh, our BVAR general meeting, a remote meeting. Uh, still the uh, Sugarland uh, Recreational Center is still closed. I got an email recently from them and they said uh, still closed till uh, for at least a few more days, if not a week or so. So uh, if anything does open up at the end of the month, I will not have our regular meeting there in July. I think it's going to be best for us to wait a little bit longer. Not possibly if we do open up, it'll be the uh, August meeting. And that way we'll start up with our uh, ice cream social. That's kind of a good uh, meeting to start up at the our new uh, our location back. And hopefully uh, we can all keep apart and still eat ice cream and stuff like that. Um, tonight we have a special guest for us, with us, um, Scott Tilly, BE7TIL. He's from Roberts Creek, British Columbia. He has a unique hobby besides amateur radio. And uh, he's gonna be telling us a little bit about it here in just a minute. One thing I also want to mention is we still have our uh, our regular nets, the uh, Monday through Friday stir crazy net on 146.94. We also have our Monday night two meter net 146.94. And don't forget the Wednesday night uh, 39.10 HF net. Uh, I know I'm going to forget a lot of stuff here, but that's normal for me. But we won't uh, we won't, won't go into that. Um, Rick Hiller is still sending out a weekly blast of everything that's going on. So stay tuned to your uh, email reflector. It's, uh, I really want to thank Rick for doing that every week. That's really helped out. Anyhow, real quick, I want to go over this. Is I have a little bit of information here. Scott Tilly, BE7TIL. He's uh, from Roberts Creek, British. Columbia, he's an amateur astronomer. Astronomer, I can't even talk today. And he routinely scans the skies for radio signals for classified objects orbiting the Earth. Uh, since he started doing this, he's located dozens of secret and unlisted satellites. When British Columbia locked down due to the COVID-19 virus, he found himself with lots of free time to do things. He ended up locating LES-5 on March 24th. He calls them zombie satellites. And uh, it was a satellite that was originally put up in 1967 and was supposed to shut down in 1972. Apparently it didn't. So for once your tax dollars are getting well used, uh, even today, even though nobody's using the satellite. Scott, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you whenever you're ready. Well, thank you so much. And uh, thank you for uh, inviting me to come and speak about uh, this tonight. Um, I hope you guys won't find it too boring. Um, I'm going to pretty much just take you through the events of how uh, LES-5 got located and just kind of how we confirmed what it was and how we started figuring out how to protect perhaps uh, reuse the satellite or uh, obtain information about it um, so we could understand what it's saying because it's, it's presently sending coherent and meaningful telemetry. So, so with that, I'm going to um, switch over, hopefully, to a screenshot of there, you should see uh, a guy with a rain barrel standing beside him. That rain barrel is LES-5. So if I could get some kind of affirmation that you're actually seeing something meaningful, then I'll know see that. It. Okay, perfect. Okay, so that is LES-5. It's, um, it's a cylindrical object. It's about uh, two meters, six feet high, uh, maybe four feet in diameter. It was launched into a subsynchronous uh, orbit um, what that means is it was not quite high enough to put it into geostationary orbit and it's 
drifts rather slowly eastward, about 30 degrees a day. Um, the U.S. military in the late 1960s launched a series of X-band communication satellites into the exact same orbit. And they were um, used for a, a number of different military applications. But what the U.S. military lacked was the ability to tactically communicate with soldiers on the ground. And here's a little video a, a excerpt from 19, from an old film about LES-5. And I'll let it play for about a minute and a half because it'll give you some pretty good context of where LES-5 came into things. We're not hearing audio on the YouTube. No, you're not getting that? No. Okay, so suffice to say, I'll just let the video play in the background. The Navy, uh, Army, and Air Force in the late 1960s were somewhat engaged with uh, some tactical activities uh, over in Southeast Asia. And they really lacked the ability to communicate directly with soldiers over anything but short wave, really. Um, they didn't have um, the UHF satellite communications network that we have now to allow soldiers pretty much anywhere in the world to communicate um, with other soldiers anywhere in the world. So LES-5, or actually the LES family of satellites, was a, a, an experiment with developing a UHF transponder communication system that the US military could test. So LES-5 was the, full, the first full on testing of that. And I'm just gonna accelerate the video here a little bit. Hopefully I don't overshoot it. There was a program in the 1960s that came into being very, very quickly. And uh, it was uh, Project uh, 591. And it and LES-6 were, were funded by this. And they rushed the development of these two satellites uh, and then launched them into orbit in 1967 and 1968, respectively. So with that, the, um, these, the, the satellite we're talking about today was put into space. Uh, rather um, interestingly on Canada Day on July 1st, uh, 1967, which was Canada's 100th anniversary. So there was some synergy there for finding it. Um, so with that, LES-5 was put into orbit. It had a rather spectacular test and tryout. There was some minor issues with it uh, as they uh, operated the satellite and figured things out. Um, they rushed it into development. So there was a few bugs in the design. So and those bugs, as they turned out, are highly interesting to us now as we try to understand the satellite more. So I'm going to um, switch, switch over here to uh, hopefully another page that has, we don't want the full screen anymore. Let's get rid of that, exit full screen mode. So the recovery of LES-5, you can see here in this image, uh, LES-5 is the round circular object, and these are the, uh, uh, those X-band communication satellites. They were launched in uh, groups of three, and there was a, a, a couple of other payloads launched with LES-5. So it was a rather busy launch, and it was placed into the subsynchronous orbit with um, ID CSC 16 through 19 and Dodge-1. Dodge-1 was rather interesting. It was the first satellite to take a color image of the Earth and the full disk image. So it was launched into this 3,300 uh, or 33,000 kilometer circular orbit on July 1st, 1967. It went through its mission and proved out that UHF's tactical communications were not only viable, but extremely uh, useful, even with the limited technology that LES-5 was built with. And that was that. It did its thing for uh, a few years. It was uh, after the military was done testing with it, some other civilian government organizations uh, used LES-5 for a couple of years. And then in the early 1970s, they um, apparently switched it off. And rather interestingly, here's another kind of anecdote about LES-5. LES-5 had only had one battery on board and its only purpose was when the battery exhausted itself, it was supposed to shut the satellite off. So apparently that battery 
didn't work out so well. It's either that or it's a really good battery. So why did I go looking for LES-5? Well, it turns out LES-1 operates in a rather unusual frequency band and was picked up by uh, Philip Williams, G3 uh, Yankee Papa Quebec in 2013 on the 237 megahertz band, which used to be used for satellite, uh, and it still is by the Russians actually, but it used to be a, a fairly active satellite band in the 1960s. It's now pretty much devoid of all satellite activity except for some uh, uh, low Earth orbit Russian comm satellites, military comm satellites. So developing equipment and antennas that are uh, resonant and tuned and you know filters that are all set up for this band is not stuff that you find off the shelf. So I had to construct a bunch of equipment to go searching around on 237 megahertz um, to produce a decent signal. So what I started with was looking for LES-1, um, which uh, uh, Philip had found. And uh, once I built this little Yagi and pointed it at LES-1 on the first pass, and there it was, uh, sending a nice strong signal in its highly elliptical orbit doing its thing. So with that knowledge, I had done a considerable amount of research on LES-5 and LES-6, and I considered them possible targets of interest. And it just so happened LES-5 was in the sky at that time. And so I aimed the antenna at it and went looking for it, and I found a, a weak modulated signal. Um, it could have been, as you know, most VHF bands are heavily polluted with uh, uh, um, noise and whatnot. So the signal wasn't all that overwhelming and all that convincing that I was seeing uh, the actual satellite. I had a pretty strong indication based on a lot of experience that I was seeing a modulated uh, uh, PSK type signal uh, or BPSK type signal and decided to um, wait until that evening. And it turns out in the, in the, fall, in the spring and in the fall, you can identify a satellite that's in a relatively high Earth orbit when it passes through eclipse. And you might wonder, well, you know, how do you know? Well, what happens is even on a, a healthy satellite, here's GOES-13, which is a, um, a weather satellite that was being moved over to the Indian Ocean that I noticed last year. You can see its carrier. And then when the eclipse started, there's an anomaly. And when the eclipse ends, there's an anomaly. And this is pretty unique. And here's another satellite. This is a military um, missile detection satellite, uh, DSP F-15, which is now decommissioned. And it's only operating on solar panels, much like LES-5 uh, uh, is. You can see here, here's the carrier. At this point here, uh, the satellite entered eclipse. The carrier stopped. When the satellite returned to uh, exited eclipse, the carrier came back on. And you can see this thermal response as the satellite warms back up and starts emitting on the, the, the frequency that you saw it go into. So I hypothesized if I'd saw this signal and LES-5 is not supposed to have a battery, that I should see the carrier disappear and then reappear at very precise timings as it passes in and out of eclipse. LES-5 isn't lost. Um, the US Space Command is monitoring the satellite and publishes orbital elements for it daily. and what is unusual about LES-5, it's not supposed to be transmitting. And here's a comment. Uh, I found an old paper about LES-5 published by the uh, Lincoln Lab that built it. And it says, uh, spacecraft power system, all on board electrical power except a small battery uh, in the uh, five-year turnoff timer is supplied by solar, uh, solar cell arrays. Uh, then it goes on to describe how that system works and in incredibly, uh, gory detail. So apparently LES-5's battery uh, didn't do its job and was relying on its solar panels, 53-year-old solar panels, to provide it power. So that night, I set up to monitor the eclipse and it entered eclipse right on time. We saw it disappear and then we waited an hour and a half almost and then saw it exit eclipse. And this plot here shows the trajectory of the satellite and you can see the uh, yellow line is when it should be in full sunlight. The light gray line is when it should be in the phenumbral portion of the eclipse where the eclipse isn't quite total yet. And then the dark gray line is, is as it's going through the eclipse. Now, here's a plot of the timings 
of that. And you can see the satellite signal abruptly ends when it's expected to, uh, 0535. And then you can see it returning at 0640 approximately. So, so with that, that, that was a really good, you know, I had confirmed to myself that I'm more than likely looking at a 53 year old satellite. And then I asked a chap in, uh, in Italy to perform the same experiment a few days later once LES-5 had drifted to over Europe. And he was able to confirm the same thing. And I went and repeated the, uh, the data into the computer and confirmed the timings with, uh, with the current orbital elements. So with that, we were pretty much sure we were seeing LES-5. Now, the question became, is LES-5 or was it sending anything meaningful? It's a 53-year-old satellite. Is it just gibberish, et cetera? So I contacted another amateur radio friend, uh, Daniel, Estevez over in Spain, EA4 uh, GPZ, and he was able to, we were able to reverse engineer from a couple of papers the, the, the bit rate, uh, which is 100 bits per second. Um, that's how fast it sends data. It's just standard BPSK, and we were able to build a, a decoder um, very quickly, and Daniel has a wonderful blog post where he goes through the process of looking at the the signal and the old technical information and being able to uh, get the uh, be able to code decode the data so at that point we could decode the ones and zeros from the satellite but we didn't know much more about it so what we started to do is review all of these old papers that's what the signal looks like on a, on a waterfall display so you can see there's a repetitive part to it and you can start to see the characteristics of the signal on the waterfall. And as we started to get data, we had issues trying to find how this, the, the digital signal was sent, how it was synchronized. And we found a bunch of these old declassified military papers uh, written by MIT uh, Lincoln Lab. And they started to provide us some information about what, how the signal was structured. So it was basically sampling every 10 point two, four seconds. The satellite spins at about 5.3 seconds. And we were able to determine from the old papers the, the general structure of the data. And from that, we were able to build a, not only be able to decode the signal, we were able to start to de uh, or, uh, actually decode the telemetry into its original word patterns. Uh, we found its syncing information. And we also found the general structure of all the words that it says. And most interestingly, um, in, before we actually decoded the, the, the data, we actually discovered in the old papers that there's most likely an experiment that's still running on LES-5. And that experiment was the radio frequency interference experiment. In the late 1960s, there was no data about really who's using these UHF bands that the military was planning on using as a tactical communication system. So what they did on LAS-5 and LAS-6 is they built the, the, the system in such a way that it could transmit what it was hearing and basically waterfall plots or spectrum plots every so many uh, minutes. And you'd be able to see over time the, uh, any signals that were appearing in an approximately 30 uh, megahertz uh, swath of spectrum that they were interested in the, uh, on the UHF band. So from 255 to 280 megahertz, they were scanning and then rebroadcasting that information down through the telemetry. And when we started looking into the technical information, as you can see here on this, uh, this paper that I've written and highlighted, we saw that the command receiver and the RFI experiment share the same piece of hardware. That's really interesting. Then we noted that there was some hardware in there to switch in um, uh, basically extal markers, like crystal markers, in to calibrate what the ground station was seeing every so many, approximately every hour. So you'd get one group of uh, RFI data that would have onboard reference oscillators switch in and that should create a very unique signal and as we dug through the papers they actually provided us what the signal should look like approximately so if we were decoding the telemetry words and we were understanding things correctly we should eventually find this pattern in the data and we'd be able to identify which words were actually sending the radio frequency interference data <clears throat> 
So we kept digging into it and we found that LAS5 had a couple of uh, birthing issues, uh, with timing problems, et cetera. Um, you know, all of these details started to form our ability to actually hack the satellite because the only thing we knew was we knew what uh, we knew the basic structure of the telemetry in the sense that what what words were actually sending data, what words were kind of housekeeping stuff like um, uh, parity bits and stuff like that or parity words and what words were um, reserved for special things like syncing and whatnot. But we didn't we didn't know the actual meaning of the actual data that's being sent. So with that, um, Daniel and I started reviewing the the uh, RFI data or looking at the telemetry words in greater detail. And it didn't take us very long before we found, as we studied it, we started to see patterns like this in the data of particular words that were being sent by the satellite. They matched what we were seeing in the old papers. But then we discovered that each, there's um, in, a, in kind of like, it's in the telemetry sequence every, every 10 seconds, there's actually four groups that are sent. And so the RFI telemetry is actually sent at a higher rate than all the other telemetry from the satellite. And once we understood that, then we were able to start to put together um, actual plots in time of the actual radio frequency data that the satellite was still receiving and broadcasting. As it turns out, um, there are signals in that data and ironically, there are other satellites. There are actually um, uh, National Reconnaissance Office communication relay satellites in high Earth orbit that are appearing in, a, in that frequency band. They're extremely high powered. And when, the, when those particular satellites pass through the uh, beam of LES-5's antenna system, those signals appear. So we know that the command receiver on LES-5 is somewhat operational. It can hear very loud signals. And we're also seeing other noise, if you will, in the RFI data. So it changes in time and, and it changes. So that experiment seems to be still running as intended. Um, so as you can see from this, there's lots of interesting stuff there. Now I've, I've been, since the recovery in, uh, in March, uh, I've been copying all of the telemetry on all of the passes that it's made over me. And so I've written this software to take the raw telemetry data that Daniel's software creates. And this allows you to actually just browse it and analyze the telemetry. And here is an example. This is an entire full pass. So each one of these, you can see these little white bars. That's the satellite passing through the eclipse each day. Each these big spikes of dots, that's the RFI experiments uh, uh, crystal calibrator sequence being seen in the data. And as I scroll down here, this is zooming in on aspects of this image up here. And you're starting to see the RFI data with the crystal calibrator on. Here's the raw RFI data, actual real mission data of the, uh, the passband of that 30 megahertz without very many loud signals at the moment. And here's a zoom in of the actual RFI data with the crystal calibrator on it. And here's RFI data. Um, that was taken as an eclipse began and as it exited eclipse. Just, you know, because there's two telemetry channels on the spacecraft that are sending RFI data. One is a peak power and the other one is um, uh, uh, sending kind of like a, a, a DB type of thing. So there's two channels sending the data, same data, but in a different way. What's really interesting is all of these other telemetry fields. And as you can see here, as you can scroll through this, it's like viewing, you can see a whole bunch of them that just sit at the same number. The red ones are actually part of the sync. We know that for sure is part of this uh, frame syncing. These blue ones are um, data that's actually sending some sensor or something on the satellite is sending a number. The green ones are parity bits. And as you can see here, this data word has got something interesting to say because there's some dynamics to it on a daily basis. So a diurnal could be a temperature sensor. It could be an optical sensor of some kind. Here's, a, here's our, um, I'm zooming into that data and having a quick look at it here. And you can see it's changing value. Maybe, you know, something's going on there, sensors detecting it. Here's another one that's kind of interesting. It's got a sawtooth wave. 
We believe this is to do with timing on the satellite um, related to the RFI experiment and telemetry transmission. And as you can see here, there's more dynamic data. Here's parity bits getting interesting because there's lots of data changing up here. And as you scroll through this, you're starting, this is revealing, you know, the health of the satellite. And as we watch this over time, this is an RFI data channel. So this is one channel that's kind of like you just keep adding them all together and you get the complete picture. So I'll just quickly there, we think this is the uh, earth sensor that actually tells the satellite that it's aiming towards earth. Um, <clears throat> as you can see here, there's a whole bunch of them that are, don't do a lot. We believe that's to do with the transponder um, experiment, which is presently off. It's probably power amplifier temperatures and uh, power output and voltages and stuff like that. They're all sitting in a, uh, there's a, quite a few of them that are sitting in a non-active state, but a lot of the telemetry, as you can see, is dynamic. And as it turns out, there is another uh, experiment on LAS-5 that I dug up uh, about a month ago. There is a uh, solar cell experiment. They arrayed a whole bunch of different types of solar cells on the uh, satellite to test um, their endurance in space. And we haven't quite figured out what that one is, but it could be one of the dynamic ones we're seeing. Um, as you can see, here's another step wave. So there's a lot of stuff still going on with the satellite and everything we can see about it appears to be semi-operational in the sense that, you know, it's doing what it was originally designed to do. And it's sitting in the telemetry only mode. So the satellite had two uh, transmitters essentially, and they were redundant. There was the telemetry transmitter, which is the one we're seeing. This is where we're getting all this data from. And then there was the actual transponder experiment, which had its own beacon. And that, appears to be switched off. The two systems, the, they could be operational at the same time, but there was a design flaw. So when they launched it, they had procedures where they would have the telemetry transmitter on. And then once they got established control of the satellite, then they would switch on the transponder transmitter and then switch off the telemetry transmitter. So it seems the satellite has rebooted into that kind of primal first life mode being deployed. So it's conceivable that if the command receiver is operational enough to actually hear a command, that the transponder could be turned on and perhaps allow some communications to, to go through LES-5. For anyone interested, um, Daniel has put up this dynamic uh, telemetry viewer on the web. I can send your group a link to it. It allows you just to go and you can see all we've got half a million, almost 600,000 frames from the satellite copied so far. And that doesn't even include the last four days of data that just ended yesterday that I haven't uploaded yet. So my goal is to collect LES-5 telemetry for at least six months. So we get a pretty good clue, pretty good idea of its durinal behavior. We can see the, the telemetry frame shifting with, um, phase angles to the sun and the earth and stuff like that. So we can start to get a really good idea of what's optical information, what's thermal and et cetera. You know, as the satellite passes through eclipse, um, that gives us really interesting information about uh, power output on the satellite. I've noticed that the signal seems to be getting slightly weaker since the eclipse season ended. I suspect that is thermally related because solar panels become uh, less efficient and generate less power as the satellite warms up. So the eclipse would have provided a, a daily cool down for the satellite. And as we noticed um, when I showed you those plots earlier of what happens to satellites when they go through eclipse, that big bump is actually the solar panels getting cooled off. So when the sun hits it again, what happens is, is that the solar power, there's more energy being generated. And that for whatever reason seems to be um, uh, causing a lot of these carriers and even a very expensive military satellites to actually drift around. So, so here, like we've got a little thing where you can explore the RFI telemetry and um, et cetera. So essentially why on earth would I spend my free time looking for lost and broken satellites? Um, it all started with uh, the image recovery and I'm just going to switch over here back to a video if I can.
Oops. Anyways, I don't know where the, uh, the little button went. Um, it all started with image. Uh, I recovered image uh, a, a little over a year and a half, two years ago. And I wasn't really looking for a zombie satellite or a satellite that wasn't supposed to be active. I had noticed quite a few in my hobby over the years. Um, and like many of you uh, that may be interested in amateur satellites, I've been interested in amateur satellites since I was a kid. Um, you know, building and antennas and radios and everything else. So it's always been a hobby of mine. And it's just gotten more and more into the um, kind of the esoteric part of it. I started tracking optically and with radio classified military missions uh, because their orbital elements up until recently, most of them were not published. So we did a, quite a bit of work with a, a small group of uh, amateurs around the world, just keeping tabs on those objects and um, publicly listing where their orbits were. And it started when, when an image was, uh, was recovered, I was actually looking for that uh, SpaceX payload Zuma, uh, which was from some unidentified government agency in the US that apparently failed in orbit and re-entered. Um, being skeptical, uh, we kept looking. and because my weather was bad and the lighting angles were wrong for optical observation of, of anything in that orbital plane, um, I started a radio search and I came across image. And I, I'm sure many of you have probably uh, heard about that story. Um, if not, uh, just Google my name and there's lots of stuff to read on it on the internet. Um, there's even a nice little documentary a group made. Um, but from there, I started taking the study of zombie satellites a lot more seriously. Um, it occurred to me that, you know, when I started reading a lot of the older literature that switching satellites off and making sure they stay off is probably a pretty good thing. And it's only been exas that's that, that thought has only been um, increased in my mind, particularly with the launch of all these SpaceX uh, Starlink satellites and everything else. And I ask you to think, um, in a non-political, but just a technical manner, what would happen if some engineer made a mistake in his design and for whatever reason, uh, every Starlink satellite malfunctioned the same way like LES-5 has and continues to broadcast and we're unable to control them. So we could lose large areas of spectrum for periods of time until all those satellites ultimately fail completely or you know, operation in that area of the spectrum might be degraded. So while these satellites right now, the small number of zombie satellites that I've cataloged, I've, probably, I've got between 50 and 60 that are presently active or have been recently active um, that are still emitting RF somewhere on the radio spectrum. And when they're no longer under human control and nobody really knows what's going on with them. So what would happen if we had hundreds, if not thousands of objects like that in orbit? So I think you know, part of the passivating process, uh, most satellite operators really try to do that now. But I'm, I wonder, as we start to send mass constellations of objects into orbit, where you're mass producing the satellites, but one mistake in a design could lead to congestion of the radio spectrum in an unexpected way. I wonder if we should be starting to think about that more. And maybe, um, you know, as we rightly concern ourselves with space junk in orbit and what that might do to space missions, but also consider the fact that unintended radio emissions from spacecraft could be very problematic. Yes, they make for an interesting hobby, but uh, no, I, I think as all amateurs very, very quickly learn, uh, unintended radio noise is never good. Um, so with that, um, uh, I'll, I guess I can turn it over and answer any questions you guys may have about LES-5 or zombie satellite tracking or just anything that, uh, that, that I may have said or you've maybe read about that you may have a question. If anybody wants to ask a question, use your space bar. Somebody's got to have a question. I don't know what the protocol one. is for breaking in. I have one. <laughs> Um, I, what was the uh, initial uh, intention of LES-5 back in the 60s? I, I must have missed that part at the beginning. No, no, no problem. 
Uh, LES-5's original mission was to test a UHF communication satellite from the military. So the, the United States government considered it of utmost importance to get a UHF transponder into orbit so that the three services of the US military could test it and figure out um, how to solve the tactical communications problem they were having. And you can see the result of it now. There are literally dozens of UHF um, tactical communication satellites in geostationary orbit now, providing the service uh, that goes right back to this satellite. So the history or the legacy of LAS-5 is long. It, it casts a very long shadow. And you know the, uh, the, the, the militaries of the Western world rely heavily on it to, um, to commu intercommunicate. Do we know if it was used uh, by troops on the ground during the Vietnam War? I don't think it was operationally used, but I, who knows? They, you know, I know it was tested in Southeast Asia. If you watch that video that, uh, that I started showing there, if you watch it all the way through, you can see where they're actually testing in jungle-like conditions and in tactical environments. So yes, I believe it was probably field tested. Uh, um, they actually have video or a footage of... Uh, a helix array in the jungle because they, they wanted to know how well UHF uh, waves would pass through uh, foliage and uh, undergrowth so they could get a sense of that. They also tested extensively in aircraft and on ships. Um, so I would imagine there probably was some limited military use, but not being an operational system yet, um, it was probably not extensively used uh, uh, for military operations. But that's just a guess on my part. What uh, sort of equipment are you using to, to copy these uh, new geosynchronous satellites? Um, I can bring up probably an image in here. Give me one second. But right now I'm using, uh, I've, I've built a couple of um, six element Yagis that I've stacked that I'm using for the uh, reception. Um, it seems adequate gain and narrows the uh, beam width enough so I'm not picking up too much noise. So which is always a handy thing. And I'm just seeing here, if you give me one second, I should be able to, there's the single antenna. So it's just one of these really simple J-pole type Yaggies that I've optimized for um, 237 megahertz. Here it is stacked. So I've got two of them and I've just used some 75 ohm coax to make a uh, stacking harness. I have a, uh, a mill, a SATCOM uh, filter and a, a broadband preamp in that. And then I'm running that into a uh, air spy uh, for the receiver that's dedicated to this project at the moment. The array here tracks. So, so it keeps the, the beam of the uh, antenna pointed at the satellite as it drifts slowly by, you know, so that's where, how I'm able to just copy the telemetry and uh, for days on end. So does that answer your question about the hardware I'm using? Yeah, it does. I was just targeting back to my days in the early 90s with uh, Oscar, Oscar 10 and so forth. Yeah, exactly. This is very, when I was a kid, um, Oscar, Oscar 10 and Oscar 13, I had a little three or four element Yagi just like this. Uh, and I made a couple of cross, cross them and phase them. And that's what I used to use on, the, on those satellites. It wasn't the greatest antenna, but it was something I could do. <laughs> We're using for the tracking mechanism. Is that something that you built or is that something that you bought? Because that's a difficult thing to actually get running. Um, the mechanism is extraordinarily cheap. It's all junkyard parts. Um, you may, it's hard to see this image. Maybe I'll see if I can't zoom in on it a bit. No, it's not going to let me. So anyways, the, oh, there it goes. The elevation rotor, some of you may recognize, is the uh, a venerable uh, uh, Alliance U110 television rotor turned on its side. So that's what I'm using for the elevation portion of it. The, all the antennas are balanced, so this guy has a hope of surviving. And then I have just your standard, um, uh, you know, CDE rotor, ham rotor. And I'm using a EA4TX um, ARS USB device that actually interfaces with the rotor controller. And I have a, um, 
elevation sensor. You can't see it in this picture, but there's a little accelerometer elevation sensor. And there's a potentiometer inside the, uh, uh, the TX5 uh, rotor here that feeds back to the controller. And, you know, it works amazingly well for like one or two degree tracking work. I track the moon with it. It works well on my S-band system. Um, on the other side of the array, I don't know whether this photo has the uh, UHF antenna. And I've also got a C-band horn up here now. So, so that's, that's the, the basic uh, tracking system that I use. But there's nothing expensive about this. These unit and rotors, I find them at the dump here periodically. And every time I see one, I bring it home and uh, throw it in the pile. Um, this CDE rotor, I've had this since I was a kid. I picked it up at Dayton years and years ago and I rebuilt it and it's kept going. So there's the real trick of the, the whole thing is this EA4TX device. Um, you can buy one of those uh, directly from EA4TX. And uh, so if you're interested in building up a tracking system with a minimum rotor equipment, I would highly recommend it. It looks like a whole lot cheaper setup than uh, my old uh, Yezu LAS rotors. Yeah, you know, the I've, I looked at those years ago and, you know, being a real cheap ham, you know, I just couldn't justify spending a thousand bucks on that when I could spend a thousand bucks on something else that I really, really needed. So I guess if I had no other options, um, but having a pretty deep junk box, that's where a lot of this stuff comes from, right? You know, years and years of being in the hobby and, you know, having stuff cast off to you, you know, coming home and finding things left on your doorstep <laughs> type of stuff. So, Bravo. Uh, so it's, that's pretty much one of the things that I found like, a lot of these older rotors uh, came from one of my Elmers years ago. He would, he collected this stuff. And when he passed on, I ended up, you know, cleaning out his garage and et cetera. I'm sure a lot of your guys in your club are, have similar stories to share. Scott, how many channels does it appear that the satellite has? Data uh, sorry, how many channels? Data channels. It only has one presently, but there are, um, there are 32 in each kind of data uh, uh, page. There are 32 words. So and there's, and there's four pages. So you have 128 words that it's sending. And those are eight bit numbers that they're sending. So those could be either sync, they could be parity bits or data words or RFI experiment data, et cetera. So there's quite a few of them that we haven't figured out yet. Um, we're, we're starting to deduce them. And we recently got feedback from a reporter that uh, MIT Lincoln Lab has finally made some kind of statement rather than no comment about LES-5's recovery. And what they've shared with us is that because of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, they're obviously staffing and priorities are very different right now. And that they intend once things somewhat return to normal, they will assign some people to look into this and hopefully uh, be able to dig out some of the older references that we haven't been able to find and figure out the, the final meaning of the last bit of telemetry. And maybe, maybe somebody there still has equipment that they could send a command to the satellite and see whether the transponder will turn on. So apparently they did not have any terminal plan to re-enter the satellite manually. No, being in a, a, a 33,000 kilometer circular orbit, the delta V required the deorbit that satellite would be enormous. It would almost be equivalent to what, how they got it up there. So, so the only way, basically a satellite like that um, would be left in its orbit because it's not really a highly interesting orbit anymore. Um, it would just be deactivated, passivated. In other words, disconnect all energy sources. LES-5 ideally would have contactors or something in there that would open the power from the solar panels to the electronics, and then the satellite would passivate itself. I presume that was what they tried to do with this battery they had on board. The idea being that it would last for five years and then it was holding something closed and then would open that circuit and the satellite would die. And apparently that circuit failed. And ironically, um, Satellite builders in the 1960s really struggled with that. There's quite a few objects that are still emitting in that time frame um, where their turnoff timers failed and the thing just kept going and either until the electronics died finally or it's still going today. There are some satellites from 1964 still transmitting, for example. <laughs> 
they're just not coherent like LES-5. LES-5 is unique in the sense that it's a really old satellite that still makes sense. You know, it's, it's, it's not like it's got Alzheimer's disease and, you know, just uttering gibberish. It's, it's, a, it's a coherent satellite that appears like it could be, re control could be regained. Do you, do you, do you track any the camp satellites? Um, periodically. Um, I do have a, uh, a SATNOG station set up here. It's offline at the moment because of uh, the LES-5 project. I'm using the same coax that I would have. If up here, you'll see this little vertical. That's what I use for the SATNOG system. And uh, I'm presently using the coax that feeds that to feed the, um, uh, the LES-5 antenna. But normally, yes, I do track amateur satellites. I, I don't put a lot of interest there at the moment. Um, I was really into the high earth orbit stuff um, when they were operational um, and when I was younger. And if they ever returned to that kind of stuff, I'd probably get interested again. I find the low earth orbit stuff, um, it's mostly beacons and stuff like that. And, you know, so I haven't really followed that too much. Uh, I've gotten involved at times when they need help identifying them after they've launched a, you know, a whole bunch of them at the same time. Um, I use the same radio tracking techniques uh, to help some satellite operators identify their satellites. I do get outreach from, from groups periodically that ask for assistance, uh, either identifying their satellite or like the Irvine High School uh, uh, group, um, the school system, I work with them. They, they have a satellite building program in their high school system. And um, I've helped them track their satellites, uh, two of their satellites that they've currently launched into orbit and was able to confirm the orbit that it was in and obtain telemetry for them. So that, that's kind of the, my present involvement in amateur satellites. Scott, I, I want to thank you uh, on behalf of um, myself in North Florida here on your presentation, but I'm late for another Zoom meeting. I got to leave, but that was phenomenal. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're most welcome. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Uh, very much so. Very informative. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thanks for joining, Ron. Hey, Scott, uh, have you yes. heard about the, um, the truck drivers in South America hacking the military satellites for their personal communication systems? <clears throat> oh, absolutely. Yeah. You just, uh, you go, uh, you scan through the transponders at a, like 250, 260 megahertz. You just sweep through there. If you've got an antenna that's half, I don't know, just a piece of wire sticking out your window pretty much and stick an SDR on it you'll be able to listen to guys talking in Portuguese going through all your uh, really expensive uh, UHF, you know, satellites sitting in geostationary orbit. Yeah, it's very, very common. Um, I've never had a time when I haven't scanned through the bands and heard it. There's also, um, there is a Chinese um, like FM or TV rebroadcast link that catches one of the um, uh, UHF satellites over the Pacific and it's, you know, you can sit there and listen to Chinese television if you want. Um, so that, yes, there's a lot of unintentional stuff going on there too. I know there, there was a period of time when the Russians had a cellular telephone network um, that overlapped some of the frequencies used by the U.S. military uh, and NATO, etc. cetera. Um, so you would be hearing, you know, Russian telephone calls coming through <laughs> on some of the transponders. So yes, there's, there's quite a bit of, I wouldn't, unintentional and also illicit activity. Apparently a lot of these guys uh, in Brazil and, and South America, what they're using is, is amateur um, gear, like two meter equipment. And they're using like a, a Veractor multiplier, like a doubler or whatever to get themselves up into the 300 megahertz range with where the uplinks are. And then you can use anything for a receiver that'll tune the area. And they're, they're just using standard FM, um, you know, some of them wider than others. You can imagine it's kind of like CB in a certain sense, but and they get these big round table chats going on and they just sit there for hours, rag chewing. So yes, there's there's quite a bit of stuff like that going on. Got a little bit about hey, Scott, uh, the, the guys that designed these uh, satellites, apparently they were designed to turn themselves off. Did they not give themselves a way to do that remotely? I would imagine so. Uh, these earlier satellites, you, you have to, to, to give the guys at Lincoln Lab and, and the military some credit here. In 1967, imagine the technology that would have been required 
to encode a 100 BPS signal with all of the complexity that we're seeing in that telemetry. Parity words, that's not, they didn't launch it with a microcontroller. That's all discrete logic. You know, they built a computer out of chips or parts or transistors or whatever the hell they used to build this thing. And it was all discrete. You know, there was no, so when you consider the complexity of this thing, um, it, it's, it's, it's really amazing to see this technology that existed in 1967. And, you know, the, and if you read or look at some of the things that they were doing, they actually had a digital terminal that they were experimenting with that would send uh, 48 or sorry, 2,400 baud uh, data through the satellite. So a guy could sit at a keyboard and chat with another guy around the other side of the world and send text messages back and forth. So you can see how they were thinking. And if you look at present UHF military satellites, you'll see data. That's the military traffic you see going through it as like broadband data or spread spectrum data. You barely even notice that the military is using the transponders, but you'll see all of a sudden this burst of data and what they're doing. This is like, you know, they're sending images, they're sending, you know, you know, memos or whatever they're sending. Um, obviously highly encrypted and, and whatnot and jam resistant. But, um, you know, that, that's what LES-5 was all about. They were testing this whole system, and it was just amazing technology for the day. Two questions. Um, do you know the uplink frequency? Yes, we do. Yeah, it's all public. There's, there's a, a bunch of papers that I have references to um, and all the public documentation that I've uh, written about it, and so has Daniel. And uh, yes, you can, all that stuff is known. That's we even know some of the commands numbering sequences. So we don't know how the commands are actually parsed or modulated, but we know what uh, we, from the papers, we know that there are certain commands to turn th certain things on and off. It seems rather limited, um, but it, they, 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 they have the ability to shut stuff on and off. My only, my thinking on why it's still emitting is that, due to some kind of electrical anomaly, um, the satellite rebooted itself. I'm sure when they switched it off, it was switched off, but something has caused it to come back to life, um, whether it be space weather or some uh, malfunction on the satellite itself. I have no idea, but, you know. I think it was probably by design that you, you so having some history, let's just say, uh, you want to avoid having an ability to command one of these systems to uh, be to fail mm -hmm. a lot, and so yeah. image is a good example of that. They 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 there was a design flaw in it that when some when a certain event happened, the satellite would shut off and you wouldn't be able to control it, and they had to wait for it to reboot itself. In other words, the batteries to go toast and then the solar eclipses to to cause it to to reboot. And um, I, I would imagine something like that happened on LES-5. The only difference is LES-5 is a non-battery satellite. So it's something must have stressed it or pushed it in the right direction to, to, to bring it back. So it had a battery on board, but it wasn't to keep it alive. It was a battery to activate the passivator. The, yeah, the kill switch. <laughs> it was, kill it, switch. Yeah, you're like, you imagine that you wow. have a battery <laughs> in your pacemaker and you're <laughs> right. yeah. that's morbid <laughs> yeah that's that's essentially what it was and it, it was funny reading that it was kind of reminded me of those funny memes you see on facebook or on uh, on twitter or you know from time to time you only had one job you know <laughs> that's awesome and, and i think the other thing is that being an experiment and what they were doing with this particular satellite a lot of the things that eventually ended up in that type of communication system weren't built yet or designed or, or even thought of, right? There was yeah. no downside to this if somebody overheard the data. There's no downside to this. You didn't need to encrypt a lot of stuff, right? It wasn't yeah. tactical. Whereas on tactical comms in the real world, uh, we that gets managed in a pretty significant way. Uh, a lot of the kinds of things you were talking about with the people kind of bootstrapping stuff, the people who are using the things they're bootstrapping don't really care because mm -hmm. their comms are a lot more sophisticated than that. Does that make sense? Yep. 
So like so basically, I, sorry, go ahead. I was just, uh, is, I, I probably missed it, but did you have a reference somewhere where your, your papers can be found? Yeah, I can send you all the links to it. Um, if you, if you want to note this down, Google riddles in the sky. It's my blog. I periodically, any significant observations I make or musings that I have about satellite tracking. There's a, a, a there's three of us that are contributing on that blog right now. Um, one of the chaps is a scientist, uh, Dr. Case Basso over in the Netherlands. He's him and I developed uh, mostly him because he's the brainiac guy. Um, developed some software to do Doppler tracking, be able to take a Doppler curve and identify which satellite it is. Um, so yeah, it's yeah. Have a look there. Riddles in the sky. Scott, any information you like? To I'm sorry. Say again. Scott, any information that you have that uh, I'd be glad to put it on our website and everything. Yeah, I could send you a brief email with a list of links. Um, definitely have a look at that video, the full video, if you've got a, if you still got some COVID time and uh, want to watch something. Uh, it's a little bit of history, and it's actually a quite well made uh, video, and it goes into quite a bit of the details of how LES five worked and the results of the experiments and. You know, was, and for for the day, it was you know it was a very uh, well uh, put together. Lots of images of the satellite being integrated on the ground and tested. So, so it was a big deal. And back in the day, you know, in that in that headspace of the world at that time, it was a, it was a very important satellite. And when you think about it, you know, the next one they launched in the series LES six. It was operational, uh, I believe, until the early 1980s. And they actually came, after they switched it off, they came back to it and periodically switched it back on, and it was still there. So it's hovering over the Central Pacific right now. And um, I would imagine if they had the inclination and the equipment, they could probably command it to come back online too. So, but uh, yeah. So these Lincoln experimental satellites, uh, LES-8 was shut off. Um, LES-7 was never launched. Uh, LES-8 and LES-9 were uh, nuclear RTG powered experimental satellites that were launched into a geostationary orbit just due south of me. And LES-9 um, was transmitting telemetry up until this January when I noticed it switched to a carrier and that carrier ended about two to three weeks ago. So it's, they seem to have just retired it. The Air Force oh, just sad. retired it. So, and um, yeah, so they were using that for uh, the National Science Foundation and they were using it for Antarctic comms for a while. But the, ban the, the bandwidth that they could get to the thing compared to all the other retired or semi-retired military satellites they could use for that now was just probably not worth the effort of, of still having people maintain it or operate it. But Where are you guys located? I'm located uh, just a little bit northwest of Vancouver, British Columbia. We're in a place called the Sunshine Coast. I'm from Seattle. Yeah, just north of Seattle, yeah. Gotcha. So Scott, what's your next, uh, next project? Um, well, the LES-5 thing has kept me pretty engaged, and I'm continuing on the zombie satellite route, and I have been assembling hardware to explore the Starlink system in more detail. Um, I have been trying to hear radio signals from Starlink and have yet to hear anything, which is odd lost because... Lost satellites. What's that? They lost two of their satellites, and their first 60... Okay, so full disclosure, I run the medium Earth orbit satellite communications mm -hmm. for uh, RigNet, oil and gas. Cool. Um, the entire SES medium Earth orbit constellation. But I've been tracking Starlink because they're either a competitor or a friend. I'm not really sure yet. We haven't figured that out. But yeah, their first go, they launched 60 and they lost uh, two or three of them their first go. Uh, I've, I've been chomping at the bit to ask that question, but I didn't want to bogart and, you know, take over the yeah that's that's probably my next my next interest is to see what they're doing because based on all the fcc filings they've made they're not operating the satellites like they say they are if they unless the emissions from them are extremely weak and my system just can't detect them but with the system i'm using i can detect geostationary uh, uh, ttnc signals from uh, ku band objects so I'm, They're supposed I'm, to be V-band, I think. They're up in the microwave 
Or yeah, they're not. they're they're using their TTNC is at, um, is on KU, and um, <laughs> they they are using higher bands, but not for TTNC. And what's um, what I'm most interested in is they have over in Redmond, Washington, is their primary tracking and control station. So I'm located in an optimal spot. If they're going to be pinging these satellites and sending commands up or wanting data back from it, I would expect to see activity on the TTNC frequency and or band anyways. And I've scanned there for a few months now and I have yet to detect anything. So, so I've ordered That's some more equipment. Yeah. So I've ordered some more equipment and I'm working on some <laughs> <laughs> working on building a little horn antenna to improve things. And I've, I've tried small dishes um, just kind of like just doing a drift kind of thing of aiming it over the, um, the, the, the plane of the satellites they'll pass through and expecting I would see pings of something and saw nothing. They're supposed to be right in the middle of their private beta right now. So yeah, they should be all lit up, like going bonkers right now, you'd think. Yes. So there, I have a couple of hypotheses. And if it was going the way they expected it to go. Exactly. <laughs> well, I have a couple of hypotheses. One is, is that a lot of what they're doing right now is not really operational and never really intended to be operational. And it's more a PR exercise and, you know, establishing that they can do this and justifying the means um, somehow. And maybe they're still in development and, you know, because they have full authorization from the FCC to do whatever they want on their TTNC. And they even have, a, they, you know, if you keep monitoring their, uh, uh, their approvals, they do have limited approval to do testing of the full system. So, and they're constantly asking for updates and everything else. So I see no reason why, you know, I shouldn't be able to s detect um, uh, LEO emissions from Starlink. So... You know, I can detect X-band emissions um, from all kinds of military stuff just down the band. You know, it's, yeah, it just doesn't make any sense to me. You know, I've never had, if the satellite's emitting, you know, you can generally hear it. It's never, it's never usually a, a thing like that. And the modulation that they're saying that they should be using from the FCC isn't, doesn't seem to be a spread spectrum type of thing. It looks like a standard uh, carrier-based, the kind of almost FM type mode. So, you know, I would expect to see carriers, you know, I would expect to see a signal of some kind, something. Something. Um, yeah. And I've noticed like some of the military stuff on S-band, they're getting sneakier um, that I've, I've over the last couple of years I've picked up that they're using some kind of broadband uh, signal with very, very old, like with heavily carrier suppressed. So the only way you know it's there is your beam is you're aimed at the satellite and then suddenly the noise floor goes up and then it goes down. And then it, over the days of it drifting through, these tend to be the satellite inspectors that they have in geostationary orbit. Um, now there's actually, that's another fascinating topic of capturing those being launched into orbit and watching them being deployed and, and then tracking them for days and weeks afterwards as they got on with their mission. I actually got a video of a time-lapse video of them arriving in geostationary orbit and being deployed. You can see the rockets firing and, the maneuvering around and doing the, the contamination and avoidance maneuver as they pass evaded the uh, Centaur final stage. Um, so it was a pretty neat, but anyways, I digress. Uh, the looking for signals, that's generally what you do is you just keep monitoring and monitor, 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 monitor for days, months, years at a time. And you get the baseline and that's where the discoveries start to happen. You start to be able to see, the anomalies like, Oh, that's never been there. Why are you here? Why am I detecting this signal? It's not on, not on my catalog and it doesn't match anything else. And I haven't seen it before. So you get a pretty good sense and it's a very dynamic satellites are very dynamic. Um, not on a day to day basis, but on a week to week, month to month, year to year, things are constantly changing. So just taking documentation, gathering lots of data and being able to, just notice the changes. That's the big one. So this is this is Mark uh, K five MGJ. I've got two questions. And sure, go ahead, Mark. Is on Starlink? Is that set up as like a mesh network so that the, uh, they communicate with each other? And are they on the same uplink downlink frequencies, or is that a, like a separate 
I believe there's separate mesh. uplink and downlink, and but I'm not sure how. I think based on some of the uh, some of the kind of I wouldn't even call it technical information. Star, uh, uh, SpaceX is release, but just kind of some of their promotional videos and stuff. I think the idea is that they can intercommunicate between a satellite and route data wherever they want. So if they, if you're, if one satellite's passing over you and another satellite has good comms with where your packet of data wants to go, it could route that way. I, um, I think that's how they're, they're structuring it. I'm not sure whether it's an actual mesh network in that sense uh, or something a, a lot more complicated and smart. So at this point that. in time, yeah, okay, at then, this point, I have no idea how they're going to do it. Okay. And then the second question I had, um, maybe not LES-5, but of the other zombie satellites, is it possible that they might be repurposed for other use, say amateur use? Um, I'm not aware of any zombie satellites that could be repurposed for amateur use other than what we're doing with them right now studying satellite signals and satellite history. Um, one of the, probably the most useful features of a zombie satellite, in my opinion, is it focuses people's attention on space exploration or the use of space in the past. And it causes people to ponder, hey, well, what, what was going on? When you start to read about some of these stories and you start to get the full picture of why we have the things that we have in our modern society today. I think that's probably the, uh, the most interesting aspect of, of the zombie satellites. Um, obviously LES five would not be able to be repurposed for amateur use because it falls outside of the amateur bands. So, and I, I highly doubt that the, you know, any government around the world would welcome amateur radio operators into the primary military tactical communications band. So, Mind you, Brazil doesn't seem to care. <laughs> so, but, but that, that would be my thoughts on it. I think the study of zombie satellites is more, for me anyways, it's more of a policy driven thing of just documenting it and then sharing that information so that people that build the satellites can learn um, that things aren't working as quite as well as they should have. And when mistakes are made, there's kind of a feedback mechanism. Because right now, I'm not aware of any kind of formal process through the UN or any other channel of communicating back to operators of satellites, whether their passivation efforts worked, um, whether they actually succeeded in putting the satellite in a, in a safe state where it's not going to explode, it's not going to keep emitting signals and cause dramas. And as you can see, um, quite often, quite a few satellites spent rocket boosters and other things, they, they break up, they explode. That's because there's some kind of energy event on the satellite, whether there's pressurized gas still in it that lets go through a failed, you know, whatever, or there's energy still stored in there, a fuel that ignites or a battery that explodes, um, et cetera. So all of these in my mind are zombie satellites. Um, <clears throat> if you want to take it to the next logical extreme is any satellite that, is should be completely inert space junk that shouldn't do anything dynamic. It's still capable of becoming dynamic. In other words, exploding, uh, changing its orbit through the venting of something, um, you know, still emitting radio signals in any way. You know, those satellites are not passivated and essentially they're a zombie satellite. So they could potentially become problematic or a nuisance, um, you know, whether spreading debris or emitting signals that just don't need to be there. How many zombie satellites do you think are out there? Well, I've got, like I said earlier, about 50 to 60 in my list that are still emitting RF that technically shouldn't be. Um, <clears throat> so I would imagine there's probably uh, an order of magnitude of other satellites still in orbit by maybe, I'm just, a, this is just a shoot from the hip guess, maybe 600 to a thousand objects in earth orbit that are not being used anymore, but still have stored energy or the potential of emitting radio signals or being turned back on. Um, so you could have spent rocket castings, uh, space tugs and stuff like that, that still have fuel or pressurized um, systems on board that could break up. Um, or you could have like LES six could be a, could possibly be a good example of a satellite you just need the right command to be sent to it and it would switch back on and it could return to operation. Um, LES-9 
Uh, I see no, unless, you know, how would they passivate a nuclear reactor or RTG other than just turn it off, um, you know, from the system. So I imagine they could probably, if they wanted to, turn it back on and repurpose it for something else. So I would imagine there's quite a few. And as far as I know, there's no public list or, you know, even on the other side, I, I'm not aware of any rumblings of a list maintained by any authority about what people have done with their satellites and what they could be capable of doing in the future. So I can, I can add to that. That's actually one of the hurdles that Elon Musk had to come get over when he was talking about launching, you know, right now he's got over 400 satellites in the Leo orbit. Um, but he's looking at launching 12,000 of these things. And you got to mm -hmm. think, you know, a, a satellite in geosynchronous orbit at 30, 30 plus thousand kilometers off of earth is traveling at about 10,000 feet per second through space, right? So when Musk started going for all these licenses and, you know, essentially <clears throat> polluting low earth orbit with all these things, he had to come up with a, a mechanism to kill off the satellites, even if he totally lost contact with them. So they're actually in a low earth orbit that's referred to a super low orbit where they actually have atmospheric drag and yeah. the earth is pulling on them and they only last about five years before they burn up. Yeah, and they've experimented, they've experimented with a couple of their early satellites and demonstrating those features, uh, yeah. that how they would get, take them out. Yes, and, but what's concerning is, is that they're also planning shells in higher and higher orbits, right? And then you come into the question, like I mentioned earlier, like how thorough is your design, um, you know, about passivating and, and deactivating the satellite and then potentially deorbiting it within the 25 years um, you're supposed to um, with LEO satellites now. So again, these are, these are big questions and, you know, it comes down to, you know, you could have nation states deciding for their own reasons and their own economic development and whatnot to do certain things with space. And there's really no coherent or observed uh, international treaties or laws that are really requiring all of these countries to, to really do their thing. The Outer Space Treaty, um, the, the, the reporting treaty in the, from the 1970s, you know, a lot of countries pay those treaties lip service, but they don't really observe them all that tightly, the United States being one of them. It's published by NASA that we actually had a very low um, passivation uh, record from a lot of the satellites that have been launched. The, the rate of success on actually passivating the, the satellites has been very low historically. Again, yeah, because and you know, who's auditing it? Who's, 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 right, exactly. There's no know, accountability. <laughs> exactly. Uh, here's a really good example. Uh, TDRS-1. Um, if you Google that, there's a big NASA paper about all this effort and money they spent on passivating the thing. Geo-17 gets launched. <clears throat> so I happen to be tracking it on S-band and it turns out the Geo-17 TTNC beacon frequency is almost the same as TDRS-1s. And who, lo and behold, what did I notice uh, as, as uh, GOES-17 happened to pass by TDRS-1? A carrier from T uh, TDS-1 after they spent all of this effort to try to passivate the satellite you know, there it is, still emitting a signal. And that was part of their passivation effort was to shut off the S-band transmitter. So, so again, I, I don't see a lot of follow-up. Um, and obviously, yes, uh, TDRS-1 was pushed into a graveyard uh, orbit above GEO. Um, they vented all the fuel. So the engines and, and thrusters are passivated. So it's not going to explode up there, creating a debris cloud. But still, it wasn't a complete passivation with um, Starlink supposed to be between 12 and 15,000 satellites and uh, one web I think it's one web they want 48,000 satellites they're bankrupt <laughs> yeah they're bankrupt but <laughs> somebody's going to come up with the money and still try to go down that route as well just like Iridium back in the 90s yep someone will buy them up yeah, and I guess the question becomes who would buy an asset like that and why? So, you know, there's awful, awful lot of military interest in these things. And that's the other thing that uh, I didn't mention earlier, that possibly SpaceX could be, um, there was a lot of very interesting statements made by senior Air Force officers right after the first Starlink mission was launched. And 
you know, which leads who's potentially one of the biggest customers of Starlink, probably the U.S. military um, and Western militaries. So, so again, there, there could be a lot of reasons why we're not seeing emissions from them or not. I don't know. I don't Look seem to have history. problems seeing emissions from other highly classified U.S. military payloads, but. That's scary. If you look at the history of Iridium, it's currently a low Earth orbit, mm -hmm. you know, the sat phones, right? Yep. And, you know, they, they launched their first missions in 99 or so. I can't remember the history exactly, forgive me, but 99. And then like nine months later, they were bankrupt. Mm -hmm. And it was right after an Air Force mission. They had $6 billion in debt, or they were worth $6 billion. They ended up getting sold off for 25 or 35 million. And now, you know, they're one of the big fish. They're, they're kind of the big, the big deal 20 years later. Yeah. They were sold so, for, they were sold for 25 million to a South African country. Yeah. They have enough money for some reason. And then next thing you know, that crazy sold again to a company in the U S. Right. And they're actually relaunching their entire constellation to compete with folks like SES doing the medium earth orbit stuff. I think they've already relaunched their constellation. It's uh, Iridium next. Yeah, 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 they've got yeah, it's they've got all the new birds up there. Yeah, Iridium, Global Star, and then of course MRSAT. Uh, they've all sent up new. Yeah, there's yeah, there's Orbicom. There's like there's all kinds of these. There's a lot. And then and then there's and then there's the Russians. They, you know, they're pretty busy with their. <laughs> hey, babe, don't laugh. There, you go scanning through yeah. the. Uh, 137 uh, megahertz band and s switch like that, and you'll find all the Stella, uh, or Strela, um, uh, low Earth orbit, or actually they're you know, like a hundred, or sorry, a thousand kilometer orbit, like 1,100 kilometers, and they're pinging away. You know, the Russians got some really interesting uh, high Earth orbit stuff. Uh, the Meridians, uh, I keep constant tabs on. Um, yeah, so you know, there's there's lots of interesting things to monitor and keep tabs on and kind of debunk the, the news that you're seeing about what's going on in space by actually just looking yourself. Well, Scott, do you have a daytime job? I do. I, I run a small marine electrical and electronics business. Anybody have that any posted on your blog? Um, about my business? Yeah. No, not really. I try to you keep the two separate. business your way. <laughs> Church and state. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. So... Anybody have any more questions for Scott? Yes, actually, I do. Uh, Scott, this is Blake. Real quickly, you started to talk about SpaceX, uh, then you kind of went away from that. Were you saying that SpaceX might, might want to try to salvage something like this? Repair? Um, launch? I, I don't see SpaceX being interested in LES-5 at all. Um, it, you know, in trying to get anything into that kind of an orbit that you could do anything with, you know, I, I, I see no real value to LES-5 other than history. And, you know, as, as a great way to spend my hobby time and studying something kind of, you know, that stimulates my brain. So that's kind of where I'm looking at it right now. But I don't see it as, you know, other than the historical value and maybe some PR value for maybe Lincoln Labs. Uh, I really don't see it being of that great interest to, to um, guys like Elon Musk or SpaceX. So I was actually talking about uh, some of the other satellites. Some of the, the newer ones that are in the zombie mode. Yeah, there's uh, accessing a lot of the interesting zombie satellites like Image and all that. They're, they're in high energy orbits that would be very difficult to rendezvous with uh, and or get at. So it's and not that it would be impossible, but the cost of a mission, it just wouldn't make any sense in my mind. You know, unless there was something really interesting. There are some projects that I'm presently involved in where there are objects in low and relatively high uh, low Earth orbit that are very interesting for the future of space exploration. Um, I'm not really going to get into discussing that stuff because, uh, um, but it's, there are objects in orbit uh, that, that uh, are very, let's say, energetic that could be very useful for deep space exploration. So, you know, I would, I could see missions to those types of things uh, because they could serve two purposes. One, removing really harmful space debris and two, potentially fueling uh, uh, deep space missions. 
So, but um, I, I don't see it being overly practical unless a zombie satellite is known that it's very unstable, that it needs to be taken out or it's going to litter, let's say the 800 uh, kilometer zone with like huge amounts of debris or something like that, which could threaten all, um, you know, a lot of weather and communication satellites and other science satellites that, that, uh, uh, that use that orbit heavily. You know, I don't see a lot of commercial need. Now I do see if, if you're going to allow these operators to put a lot of satellites into orbit, they should have some redundant means of sweeping space clean. So I would think and hope that regulators down the road would turn to entrepreneurs like uh, Mr. Musk and say, okay, that's all great that you can put all this stuff up there, but you need to demonstrate to us that you can take it out of there. You know, you need to go up and clean up, you know, the orbits you're using when you're done with the stuff or design the satellite in such a way with enough Delta V that it can deorbit itself, no matter what orbit you put it in. So I could potentially see in the future companies like SpaceX um, looking for other revenue streams of being able to go clean up objects from orbit if they can do it cheaply enough and uh, reduce the risk of space debris. There's a whole lot of gold on those satellites. All the connectors, all of everything, it's all gold. I heard that thrown around as an idea. Yeah, I'm sure there's all kinds of... Uh, uh, materials up there. I guess it just really comes down to how much are you going to get and how do you de generate a business case versus your costs? Because you got to remember, you know, so you get, you grab a hold of one satellite, you know, and now how do you get to the next one in a different orbital plane? Um, and changing the orbital plane once you're in a plane is very energy intensive. So, you know, it, it's not like you could launch one satellite garbage truck and clean out space, you would have to launch many, many, many garbage trucks into orbital planes and then, you know, compute possible rendezvous that you could do with the available Delta V on that garbage truck, for example. And then once it's out of fuel, it, it can't do anything either. So well, and you your, don't mass, to... your mass numbers get, get really weird when you start talking about that, right? Yeah. Because as you collect one satellite, now my energy requirement has gone up exponentially yes change anything and so literally the only thing you could really do is do a, a a sweep right and throw everything at the earth and that's not a really good idea if you ask me i think that's a really bad idea yeah and then you're not you know then you're not there's no economic advantage of all the materials that you could recover or whatever i could see probably initially you might see some missions to some really early um like Vanguard one type of thing, recovering Vanguard one and bringing it back and put it in the Smithsonian or something like that. Um, you know, you might see some PR missions like that, but I think what needs to happen is um, we're going to see, there's a whole bunch of different technologies for removing space debris that are starting to emerge and, and actually being tested on CubeSats and whatnot. That I, I, I would envision that at, at some point the regulators are going to start requiring the Elon Musk's and all the others that are launching large amounts of objects into orbit to just demonstrate a capability of removing things uh, when they're ordered to. So especially if there is a problem, LEO. I'm sorry, go ahead. Especially in LEO, right? Yes, the exactly. LEO plane, you're, you're seriously, you know, it's a limited set of space. Uh, from what I understood from what you said, though, the, the L LE5 is MEO high or low it's yeah it's in a low sub geostationary orbit or what we call a sub synchronous orbit it's it's just a little bit below the, the geo altitude so it from if you're standing on earth looking at it it slowly drifts from west to east at about 30 degrees a day along the along the uh, equator you know so the geo belt so if you knew where in your sky your geo satellites were it would appear on the western horizon and then four days later it would set on your eastern horizon and it would drift like about 30 degrees or so a day so that really interests me because that orbit really interests me because if you think about if it gets cheap enough to go into leo then we could do an amsat thing to put an amsat somewhere in that direction which would be very uh cool you know what i mean yeah i think uh, there was a um a european mission that was launched an early AMSAT that was launched in a very similar orbit. Um, again, 
that's an orbit like that, unlike the, the present geostationary one that uh, Qatar launched, um, you know, I think is a lot more egalitarian in the sense that it would, you know, generate interest uh, worldwide and it creates more interesting DX opportunities because the satellite moves. Um, you know, and then we come back to the, the old why, I guess, why they chose the, um, uh, the high Earth orbit, um, the uh, Molniña type orbits for Oscar 10, Oscar 13, and Oscar 40, because it gives amateurs all around the world uh, relatively equal access to the satellite, and it creates some dynamics. It cr makes it more interesting than just, okay, there's the satellite in the same spot in the sky, and it just basically becomes a repeater that everybody kerchunks. So... Um, that's my take on amateur satellites. Anyways, I would There's be another aspect to it as well. The, the further out you go, the slower the thing has to traverse the earth. So you, you can't have a geosynchronous orbit in low earth orbit. It has to be that's moving right. around the earth to stay at that orbit. So the, so for instance, like the SES 03B satellite constellation, mm -hmm. it's in medium earth orbit. There it's, uh, roughly 8,000 kilometers off the earth. It's 150 millisecond round trip on a, on a ping packet, but they're only overhead for 25 minutes, right? So on these old rigs that we've got, we have to put two antennas on them and they've got to be tracking antennas. You know, they cost a quarter million bucks a piece and mm -hmm. they've got to track the satellites. And by the time the first one is almost gone, the second one had better have lock or you, know, you lose your connection the closer into the earth that you get, the less time you've got. It's so like on an Iridium sat phone, yep. Yep. you only get that satellite for a couple minutes and then it's trying to hand off to a different satellite. So it's a real challenge trying to get Leo and actually, you know, having something that can track like your antenna array, that thing impresses the heck out of me, man. That is, that is some fine engineering right there. My hat's off to you. Thank you. Leo hey, trying to do that, it's really tough. Hey Scott. Yes. Speaking of garbage trucks from earlier, how is the X-37 doing? Um, as far as I know, it's whirring around up there. It, uh, like every other time it gets launched, one of our guys picks it off right away and we start tracking it. So um, I haven't picked up radio emissions from the X-35. Uh, apparently it's a KU band device based on some of the intelligence that we've got from studying photographs and antennas on the unit. So it's, it's using pretty high frequency stuff but uh, it's regularly tracked optically. Um, you know, when, whenever they launch the things, um, it's usually picked off within a day or two. And then we start generating orbital elements for it and just keep, keep tabs on its maneuvers and whatever it's doing up there. And if you did get emissions from it, you'd be so low in the noise, it wouldn't matter because the way they... Uh, not necessarily. Like, you know, a lot of the, uh, like the keyholes and stuff like that, their signals are huge um, when they first launch. And, you know, they're, they're very obvious, you know, um, they have kind of a birthing mode when they first get to orbit, they emit on S band like crazy for the first couple of weeks. And then once they get the satellite kind of settled down, then it, then they switch off an S band. And the only time that S band transmitter comes back on is when they do orbital maneuvers or something else significant is going on with the satellite. So it kind of gives us a bell ringer. Like for years, I used to track the keyholes, um, we didn't have the, the network we do right now of visual observers. So we used radio to kind of, as the canary in the coal mine, to tell us that they were about to move one. And then we would start monitoring it visually again. And lo and behold, they'd move. And then we'd pick up the new orbit and, you know, carry on. It was, right, it that, makes, that's the C and C though, right? Not the... I'm sorry, say again? That's the C and C, not the 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 data they're actually sending back. That's just- That's right. Yeah, that's command and control. So, and what you'll find is one of the fascinating things that I've learned by studying zombie sats over the last, I don't know, decade or so, is that the communication system is 50 plus years old, that they're still using the same protocols, the same frequency um, allocations, uh, et cetera, that they started in the late 1960s and they're still using that today for all their most highly classified military payloads up there. Now, obviously their data links and everything else have probably evolved, but the actual, how the satellites operate, what frequencies they actually use based on their missions and everything else are, is the same as it was in the late 1960s, early 1970s. 
And I recently picked up last, um, actually on Halloween of all, all times, I picked up um, the first X-band geostationary satellite. And it's sitting here in a graveyard orbit um, at about 101 degrees west, which is uh, like a gravity well spot where satellites that aren't really formally put into a graveyard eventually end up drifting into. Um, so anyways, it's sitting there and it's still emitting on 2277.5 megahertz, which happens to be the same um, TT and C frequency as the current WGS satellites, which operate the same mission. And after gathering a whole bunch of data from, you know, the uh, DSP uh, system, the current uh, cyber system, the cybers geo and the cybers HEO, <clears throat> they all they all still use the same radio frequency, the radio frequencies for their TTNC, et cetera, uh, based on their mission type. So once you kind of understand what you're looking at, you know exactly where to look um, when they're launching something new. Yeah, and I, I think the, the, the technology that changed is here on the ground, right? Yes. The ability to dig a, a usable signal and and generate information up and information back occurs at a much lower band floor than it used to, if that makes any sense. Yeah. And I think a lot, I think, I think the biggest thing is why this technology still exists and why they're still using the same systems is it's, it's, you know, look at a lot of military systems they are highly redundant. They don't change for change sake, unless it's absolutely mission critical. And with a lot of satellite design, once they've flight qualified something, they just leave it alone and they move on. And if the TTNC system is not the sexy part of the satellite, unless they need to change it, it's probably the same bus as the first keyholes were built in the 1970s. Um, you know, it's, there's a good possibility of it. When you look at some of the newer brand new satellites with like, uh, you know, ion drives and everything else, and they still function the same way. They just still have, the, they're still using the same techniques you know, you can watch them. I watch satellites go through their entire commissioning process. Um, the WGSs are great because they actually commission due south of me here, right over California. And you can watch them fire their ion drives for about four months and they slowly spiral into geo orbit, you know, as this little whisper of, of thrust brings them into orbit very efficiently. And you can, as they get closer, the radio emissions change dynamically. You can see it in the Doppler uh, effect on the signal. And then there's a process that goes through and then it switches off on S-band for uh, about a week. And then that's when I switch over to X-band and then you see them commissioning the X-band trans, like the X-band uh, TTNC system. And then both systems switch on and then they start transponder tests on X-band. And then you can, you watch them throttle the transponder for a week with super high signals and sweep stuff through it and all this kind of stuff. And then it goes into what I call an operational mode. And, you know, it's, it, the TTNC is not as angry anymore and the satellite is uh, drifted into an operational orbit somewhere else around the world. So it's, it's quite interesting to watch this stuff. And periodically when there's mistakes or issues, you, you catch that in real time. And then it hits the news. Hey, Scott. Absolutely fantastic. Scott, what, uh, when you refer to uh, visually monitoring, what do you mean by that? I mean, uh, are you using telescopes or what, what do you mean by visually monitoring? Let me pull up, if I can, a video. Uh, just give me a second here. Uh, I was going to ask the same question. I've been looking at, you know, Trying to figure out how I how I use a telescope. Like there are, there are telescope motors you can buy that, you know, will, will take and track a, a satellite or a star, you know, on your telescope. I was well, trying to figure out how to mount a Yagi to it to do the so same. <laughs> can you guys see this video? Yes. Can see okay. it. So, yeah. what this is is the arrival of a satellite in geostationary orbit, and you can see here my pointer. You see some activity going on there. It might, the resolution of it might not be the greatest. But you probably should see it now. And see that, it. Was, that was the contamination and avoidance maneuver and then the final venting of the uh, final stage. So what you just witnessed there was the arrival of two GASP 
payloads in geostationary. And these are satellite inspectors that the US Air Force operates. So, and I do have this on my YouTube. So you can watch this in HD and you can actually see it. Uh, if you're watching on an HD monitor with the full, you can actually see the individual frames and you'll see this little star moving across here. And all of a sudden you'll see it go poof. You'll see that in a second. That was it firing its thruster or engine to put it into basically put it into geo orbit. You see the two deployments of the satellites and then a contamination and avoidance maneuver. And then that's the final fuel venting where they're passivating the final stage. And then after that, for a good couple of weeks, you can see here, this is the software we're actually looking at the individual frames. What I'm using is a digital SLR camera with a, a, a really fast 85 millimeter lens. So it's not a telescope. You know, I'm observing satellites with either really fast video uh, lenses, like a 50 millimeter fast lens and a, on a very sensitive CCTV camera, or I'm using a digital SLR camera for uh, geo objects or high earth orbit, high earth or orbit objects and using a 10 second integration, like a 10 second frame. That's why you're seeing the star trails in that video. And you can see that in this image here. So, and as you can see here, these little dots, you see these cluster of other, these are satellites that come up in the software that we use that tell me the location of known satellites. And these little dots that you're seeing here are these satellites. It just, the, I've got this zoomed in so much that the positions are a little bit different. So here's, that payload arriving in orbit and here's the gas cloud from the thrust from the uh, rocket firing as it's detached. So just to give you an idea and there's, yeah. I've got tons and tons of, and generally what I do is like, here's a, 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 a picture of the actual, just the one frame. So that's 10 seconds. You can see it in the drift of these star images. Right. How far, what well, that, don't, yeah, that's, that's reaching orbit, right? So that's that's a geostationary kilometers. Yeah. That's thirty six thousand kilometers up. You now that little dot, right there, fired a rocket engine, and basically circularized its orbit. It was in an elliptical orbit, and it arrived at its at apogee, and it fired its engine in such a way that it pushed the satellites into a circular orbit around the Earth at the geostationary altitude. So where it's rotational period match the rotational period of the earth. And at that point, then it's this, this space tug is up there, this rocket booster with two satellites on it. Now it's got to deploy the satellites. So it spits out one, then it maneuvers to avoid spitting out the other one, the two colliding. And then it maneuvers, the rocket booster maneuvers again, the final contamination and avoidance maneuver. And then once it's far enough away from the payloads, it vents its fuel so it doesn't explode or create another issue later on and passivates itself. I was monitoring these satellites on S-band. I was actually using the, um, the final stage um, rocket boosters S-band video uh, transmitter to track the whole stack. And I, that's why I was able to know where to aim my camera because my uh, S-band dish also has a camera mount beside it. So I can have the camera aligned with the S-band dish. So if I'm tracking an object in deep space, I can take an image of it if I have a clear sky. And then use those, images to, use those images to generate an even more precise orbit, which is what I did here until I had an orbit prediction that was accurate enough for me to actually frame my camera precisely in the sky where this would be and be able to make a nice little video like this. And this was a classified mission. They don't tell us where it was. That is incredibly hard to do. <laughs> it just takes it best. just takes a, it takes some experience, like you know, with astronomy skills, um, and then it also you know hardware skills, putting all the stuff together. And here's the CC skills, and <laughs> here's, here's the video camera. Like I have a high speed security camera that I run up there, and you can see that it's much more sensitive to light. And this is the this is the black and white CCTV camera version of this event, and you'll see the same thing happening over here or somewhere in the frame. And you can see other satellites passing through. There it is. Yeah. <clears throat> so if you watch the video, you can see other satellites passing through the the frame that are in low Earth orbit. <clears throat> 
So. Yeah, thanks. I was, <laughs> I'm new with the satellite stuff and I was wondering how you could actually view that, but this is fascinating. Yeah, so it, that's how it's done. So it's, it's using two techniques, you know, to sense these objects. And then once you see a satellite in its orbit, if you get enough, enough observations of a satellite in an orbit, then you can predict its orbit. And satellites rarely change their orbit. So once you figured out what its orbit is, um, it's the only next, next thing you need to keep track of is through decay and whatever is where the satellite is within that orbit. So, you know, there's, after you get enough experience with it, it's like anything else. You just start to live and breathe it. And it's easy to, well, I wouldn't say easy, but you know, you know the process and you, you know, you crank the handle and do the work and now comes the answer. And how did you know it was a classified satellite? Um, well, we knew when it was publicly stated they were launching it, right? So we were, we, we generally knew what that type of orbit would be going into based on they, they issue statements about where they're going to drop debris. So they prevent, you know, killing seamen and airmen. So they, they issue public statements where they're going to drop the boosters and other debris from the thing as they launch it. So once we see that, we get a pretty good indication of what the trajectory and orbital plane will be. And we know enough from based on past missions to be able to kind of make guess orbits. And then once you do get an observation and I had made observations of it while it was still relatively low to the ground. And then uh, from those visual observations and, and the S band radio observations I was making, I was able to refine the orbit to the point where I knew exactly where they were going to inject it into geostationary orbit and aim the camera there and sit there and wait until it happened. And that answers the next one of the questions I was going to ask you why you had no TAMs in the nav warnings on your uh, top bar. Now I know. Yep. <laughs> there you go. So all these little tools up here, like the FCC is a great source of information. The ITU maintains a, a catalog of satellite frequencies. Um, you know, you know, you have all of this stuff that you use um, time conversion. Uh, most satellite tracking is done in uh, uh, modified Julian date. Um, so being able to confirm, you know, when you talk about dates that are like start off as 58, you know, 942 decimal, blah, blah, blah. How to, you know, it's, it becomes, when you really get into it, you're starting to use some pretty esoteric concepts and, and things. And a lot of them are very familiar to anybody that's gotten serious into astronomy. It's the same kind of things. And that's why I call myself also an amateur astronomer because I've learned from my satellite tracking hobby. And also I'm, I'm interested in astronomy, but I've learned uh, the basics of astronomy to the point, you know, I know how orbits work. Um, I can predict orbits. I can, you know, visualize them. Um, I can compute them, you know. And once you get to that level of it, then you, you, you kind of, you know, you can, as one of my old teachers used to say, you can, you know, discuss things with your hands in your pocket. So any other questions? For the yes, sir. Scott, this is Scott, uh, KD5FBA. Uh, very interesting discussion. Uh, the first satellite that I ever personally saw uh, was Telstar, to give you an idea of the age. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, that was, uh, yeah, there's quite a few of them. There's, you'd be interested to know that a lot of those, some of those early satellites are still emitting radio signals. So, and I believe even one of the Telstars is. I think it's Telstar 4, is still supposed to be Telstar 4 or 6 or something like that. Yeah, this little website here, there's a gentleman over in, um, let's see here. There's transit. These are the current operating ones or emitting ones, some of the really old stuff on the 137 megahertz band. So that's a good band if you're not too vexed by noise to listen to some really old satellites. But this is the oldest one in orbit, orbit that's still emitting. Transit, uh, number uh, 965, 1964-83D. And it has a very interesting signal. It's very musical. So. But uh, 
So I hope you guys got a, a, a pretty good idea of what uh, satellite tracking is all about. And, um, you know, it's, it's a great, I find it a great way to use the skills that I've learned in my amateur radio hobby. Um, I'm not too active on the bands of these days, but that changes from time to time. I was really into 137 uh, megahertz, the 2200 meter band, when it was an experimental band here in Canada. Um, I completed a, a QSO on that band with a gentleman in Japan. That was kind of the highlight of my experimental testing on that. And uh, once I kind of wrapped up that experiment, this is the, I was already into tracking satellites and I got really into it. And um, for the last 10 years, I've been really focusing in this aspect of, of my hobby. Scott, we really appreciate you spending time this evening with us. Um, well, thanks for inviting me into your uh, into your meeting and uh, to share my experiences. I always like doing this kind of stuff. It's been great. Um, obviously, it's recorded. We're going to have it up on our website and our uh, soon to be formed uh, YouTube page, probably. So awesome! I look forward to seeing that link. And uh, only thing else I can say is thank you very, very much for spending your time this evening. Yeah, no problem. It's, it's been really nice. I don't get out to uh, amateur radio club meetings uh, much, young family and everything else. So it was nice to share it with you guys. Thank you so much. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, Scott. First time on this and enjoyed it. WA5CYI. Yeah, 73 is all. Scott, thanks a lot. Cheers. Have Anybody a good one. Any other questions for, uh, for the club tonight? Uh, let me know. Scott, like I said, send everything to me and I'll get it posted on our website. I'll do that. I'll, get, I'll probably within the next 24 hours. Scott, thanks again. Thank you, guys. 73s. 73s, thanks. 73s.